Welcome you. We're looking at another story or another message from the Bible regarding uh, wrong things Christians believe. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 45 today. Jeff was no stranger to life's disappointments. His brother was born with men mental limitations of which both his brother and he were harassed about by schoolmates all their lives. And before he even graduated high school, uh, a couple of his close family relatives had been killed in accidents. Sometimes God answered Jeff's prayers, but many times he didn't. But God's, or I should say Jeff's faith remained strong, realizing that God knew better than he what was best. But it was shortly after their honeymoon that Jeff's wife was diagnosed with cancer and his prayer life increased exponentially. He began praying for accurate diagnosis and correct treatment for her, and then began praying for the treatments to, that would eradicate the cancer and that she could eat and grow stronger and not be nauseated. And God answered part of that prayer and that Julie began eating and gaining weight again. But the cancer was not going away. In fact, it was acting uh, Im improperly. The doctors could not understand why it was not responding well to the treatments. They went on to a specialty clinic with high hopes and the prayers of their family and their friends were upon them. And yet Julie's health continued to decline until Jeff found himself praying, not first for a miracle and then for comfort. And finally, he caught himself praying that the Lord would mercifully take her home. Julie and Jeff were, were a wonderful Christian couple. Everyone said how sweet and wonderful she was and how she was caring and would, would help anyone in need. So why didn't God answer the thousands of prayers that were lifted up on her behalf? In our anxious and emotional state, we grasp in, in vain for answers and we're left wanting. I've officiated several services for sudden death in syndrome of babies that had died and for accidental deaths of small children. What can you say to comfort families? As one parent said, uh, this was my worst of nightmares. That was what they were all about was this issue. Those are the worst of times and the feelings never go away, I fear. Though hundreds of, of condolences are given, though no one can ever come up with just the right words to say that the, the parents would respond, oh, thank you. That's just what I needed to hear. I'm okay now. No. It'll only be through God that can help us through those issues and times. And thankfully, we can be sure he will because we can't fix the problem ourselves, but we can be instruments of God's love by praying and being there for them. But we can't take their pain away. So the big question still hovers over us. If God is loving, if he is there, if he is in control, then why does he let this happen? In our grief and our doubts, as they grow, the age-old question still begs to be answered, why? Job's friends kept prodding him to just admit it already. You did something wrong and God is punishing you. Even Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? To which Jesus replied, neither. In response to our questioning, our doubts, and our anguish, I have a few thoughts for us to consider. And first is that God does not always answer our questions. As we read the Gospel of Luke, there's an interesting event that took place. And it goes like this in Luke 13. Now there was some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galilee, Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Asylum fell upon them. 
Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you replant, repent, you too will perish. Under the heavy hand of the Roman control, the Jewish people were looking intently for the coming Messiah to overthrow this brutal occupation. And this passage speaks of a group of Galileans who must have participated in a covert uh, revolutionary activities, were captured and executed. Their blood was mixed with the blood of the sacrificed animals, implying that these devout Jews had come to the temple in Jerusalem to offer sacrifices to the Lord, but Pontius Pilate had captured them, ordered their deaths. What an outrage the people must have clamored. These were good, devout brothers who were honoring our Lord. How could such a thing happen? Was God possibly passing judgment upon them for doing something bad? Paraphrasing Jesus' response to their questions, do you think they were worse sinners than all the others because they suffered this way? Can you believe that life's sufferings are all a result of God's justice upon those who do evil? If so, then what about the accident that happened at the tower by Siloam Pool that fell and killed 18 people? Jesus was referring to a recent accident, obviously, that were, were innocent people, possibly those that were disabled and with illnesses, who gathered regularly around the pool waiting for the waters to stir that they might get in and be miraculous healed. How tragic it must have been if it were those that were trusting the Lord for healing instead had suffered such a random accident. And the, so the people continued asking, why do bad things happen to such good people and innocent children? The typical answers are, it was an act of God, which is what insurance companies call acts of nature. Another explanation is that the devil did it, that people were touched by the influence of evil, or that it was a result of something that they had done, and God was punishing them for it. In our current society, it might sound more like this. It's karma. A balancing of something you did is paid back to you. A good for a good or a bad for a bad. Interestingly, Jesus doesn't answer the question in, the, in any of those ways. Not an act of God. Not that the devil did it. And he plainly rules out that it was the bad that people did when he says, I tell you, no. In fact, he doesn't answer the question at all. He doesn't share the meaning of why those people happened to die. But what he does do is he tells the people who are still alive and asking those questions, he says this, but unless you repent, you too will perish. By his silence, He's telling us that tragedies are a part of life. Life is fragile. It's fleeting and should be appreciated as a precious gift. Tragedy does get our attention that this earth is not our home. So we must look beyond it to the relationship that we have with an eternal God. Secondly, this world is a fixer-upper. It's a mess. I remember back in the 60s, uh, driving towards Seattle and seeing the skyline from a distance and looking at it and seeing how majestic and beautiful it was. But it wasn't long after that that I would be downtown walking the streets past alleyways and, and along sidewalks where there was garbage and empty bottles and paper bags, which all spoke to the human despair beneath the surface. Though we are made in God's image, we are capable of very horrendous acts. Some maybe by mistake, others very intentionally. Some mistakes that are made have little difference in our lives, but others leave us haunted for a lifetime. Messes also might be uh, messes are also what the whole creation is groaning 
and pains of, like the floods and the earthquakes or the influence of human um, pollutions, groaning in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. In a sense, our planet is looking forward, just as the rest of us, to Christ's victorious return and bringing everyone home and changing everything and cleaning it all up. My father had cancer in his eye and they removed it. And amazingly, he went on with his life and driving himself to bowling and senior golf leagues. And yet the melanoma cancer continued to metastasize and spread throughout his body. My whole family suffered through the trauma of his disease. And I was angry for God for not answering and hearing our prayers and healing my father. Our lives were not going the way that I thought it should. And in my agony, there was a wake-up call that this world is not my home. I had become so comfortable here that I was overlooking that this is not heaven. The world is cursed. Yet I, I lived like it isn't. I had unrealistic expectations about what life in this world should give me. My dad's illness and death ripped all of that away, and I was in shock. But I shouldn't be, because the Bible keeps reminding, it, reminding us all of the frailty of life, and that we live in a world under the curse of sin and death. Thirdly, all things work together for good. I think that would be way too flippant a thing to, to share with someone who's going through grief but it's true. The whole world, the whole planet, as I said, is groaning under that curse of sin. And scripture says, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. This last week, a, a God thing took place as I had the blessed opportunity to talk about the very real presence of the Lord through all things to a group of people that I had not met before, nor likely, likely would have, apart from the heartbreaking illness and passing of one of our members in this church. Our, congregate, our conversations, I should say, didn't once cover the weather or the NFL draft picks that were upcoming. The family was ready, anxious even, to hear how Jesus came into the world for just such a moment in their lives as this, and meets them there bringing the message of eternal hope, hope for their loved one, and hope for their grand reunion one day. And my last point is that there is no obstacle outside of God's love. No matter what our suffering, it will never keep away God's love for us. Paul shares that in Romans 8.35, 36 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. When you're angry with God, when you refuse to talk to God, He is still loving you. For your sakes, we are being considered sheep to be slaughtered in verse 36. Paul isn't talking platitudes here. He had faced death numerous times and encouraged the deaths of Christians before Christ got a hold of his life. Paul knew how dangerous it would be to follow Christ and now teaches us that good can come through the worst of circumstances. I know it shouldn't, but every tragic situation shocks me out of my complacent thinking that earth is my forever home. And I cry out, why God? And I get angry with him because that's not the way things should go. And then I'm reminded of what Peter says. 
Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the suffering of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Paul, or Peter, I should say, reaffirms that thought by saying, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. For now on, though, from now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. And those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. 1 Corinthians 7. I know I have an obsession, if you will, obsessive view of this life that it should be comfortable and happy. And I think that's perhaps an influence of the society around us. And it is evident by the, pro the priorities of my prayers when I pray for health or status quo or my happiness, believing God's on my side and he'll do anything to protect me and my own from pain and suffering. And I'm certain, however, that that was not the focus of the Christian prayer life in that first century Christian community. God wasn't there to keep them from sufferings. No, he was there to hold them up through all things. If you were looking at Jesus right now in the face and he put his hand upon your shoulder and said, it's all going to be okay, would you believe him? Would you have peace in your heart? Would you be able to forget everything else and just re rest in that moment? Well, let me tell you, the Bible has told us that. You may not see it now, but everything will work out together for good is the Lord's words for us today. And I pray that you live that today, trusting through all things he will be there with us, that he doesn't always give us the answers, but trust that he knows the right answer to give us. I pray that you go with the Lord this day and always, trusting and relying upon him. In Jesus' name, amen.